Life is full of surprises, and so is science. In 1967, Jocelyn Bell Burnell discovered strange repeating radio signals that pulsed with the regularity of a clock, originating distantly in space. These were so regular and startling that initially they were considered to have been of alien origin, beacons of a sort. This turned out to not be the case, and in fact, the emissions were coming from pulsars, a totally new class of object that until that year had never been observed before. Jocelyn Bell Burnell's discovery ranks among the chief astronomical discoveries of the 20th century. Indeed, entire areas of research in astrophysics opened up and are dedicated to studying pulsars and associated objects. But this isn't the end of the story for strange signals being serendipitously discovered in space. In 2007, while looking at pulsar surveys, interestingly enough, Duncan Lorimer and David Narkovic noticed something new a very rapid burst of energy of unknown origin, and to this day the circumstances of what creates these fast radio bursts is unknown, though it must be an event of very high energy. And, more recently, several of these kinds of bursts have been found to repeat, further mystifying the origins of FRBs. You have fallen into Event Horizon with John Michael Godier. John is joined by Duncan Lorimer, Professor of Physics and Astronomy and Associate Dean for Research at West Virginia University's Department for Physics and Astronomy. He is a Fellow of the American Physical Society in recognition for his contributions to our understanding of pulsars and for the discovery of fast radio bursts. Dr. Lorimer, welcome to the program. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. Now, Doctor, you discovered one of the most interesting phenomena that we've seen from the universe in, in, in modern times. In 2007, you discovered a, the first detected fast radio burst. How did you find that? Yes. Um, so the fast radio bursts were first um, discovered quite by accident just over a decade ago. So back in 2006, I was working with an undergraduate student called David Narkovic. We were looking at archival data taken with the Parkes Radio Telescope in New South Wales, Australia. And uh, we were looking at the time for bright individual radial pulses from the Magellanic Clouds, which are satellite galaxies of the Milky Way. These data had been searched for, for pulsars before, which are continuous streams of pulses, but they hadn't been searched for bright pulses. And so that's what we were up to at the time. And we, we literally stumbled upon this really bright pulse that turned out to be the first um, representative of, of an entirely new astrophysical phenomenon, which we now know as fast radio bursts. And so it was tremendously exciting at the time, but uh, really quite like many things in uh, science, so somewhat by accident. Now these are, are you detected this burst from, um, as I recall, the small Magellanic Cloud. That's right. As you said, satellite galaxy of the Milky Way. Now, we have not detected these in the Milky Way itself, correct? So we haven't detected fast radio bursts in the Milky Way, but astronomers have been, have, have been studying individual pulses from what we call pulsars in the Milky Way for now over 50 years. Uh, and so we were using many of the tools that we and other people had developed over the years to, to search for these pulses in, in the data. And the, the pulse that we stumbled upon was actually just a few degrees south of the Magellanic Cloud, the small Magellanic Cloud. So it wasn't actually in the cloud itself, and it turned out to be way beyond that, several billion light years away, we think. So it was something in a distant galaxy that was it appeared to be traveling through the Magellanic Cloud. It was in a distant galaxy that was just far behind the Magellanic Cloud. So it wasn't, you know, it wasn't anywhere near the cloud itself. Uh, it just happened to be close on the sky. Now that seems to be a common theme with fast radio bursts is that they are distant. They are, they are phenomena that happen in other galaxies. Now they also appear to be 
whatever is causing them is 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 a very special circumstance, a very unusual circumstance, like a enormous magnetic field or something going on there with with possibly neutron stars. What do you think the mechanism is for creating a fast radio burst? Well, there could be multiple different populations of these bursts, but I'm I'm in, I'm inclined to start with mechanisms that I've seen in action before. And so, as I mentioned, we were studying, we have been and still are studying radio pulsars in the Milky Way for half a century now. And we have some understanding about how they generate these pulses. And that comes from the enormous magnetic field of the neutron star as it rotates the star is accelerating particles off of its surface and it sends out these, this beamed radiation. And there are some, some of these pulsars can emit individual pulses that are thousands of times brighter than the average. So one mechanism would be is that if you have such a pulsar that once every 10 years or once every 100 years emits a really uh, enormous pulse at the tail end of this distribution of, of individual pulses, then it could be seen halfway across the universe virtually. So that's that's starting with something we know, and then you can get more and more imaginative, let's say, with, with other ideas that are consistent with what we see about fast radio bursts right now. Now, when you, when you see it across great distance like that, that, that would imply great energy. So if you have a neutron star's magnetic field producing a signal like this in a cumulative effect, I suppose is, is, is how to say it, what really what causes that? I mean, is it, is it sort of just a buildup of some sort of energy? Well, it is a, it's a large amount of energy, um, that's correct. You know, the, what we estimated for the original one, it's something like the amount of energy that we saw is equivalent to what the sun puts out in a whole month. But astronomically speaking, it's actually quite a small amount of energy because it's coming out, what we're seeing is in the radio part of the spectrum. So the, as radio waves at, that, at, at, these, at these long wavelengths, they have low, they carry relatively small amounts of energy compared to, say, optical, X-ray, and gamma-ray flashes. So gamma-ray bursts, for instance, are possibly a related phenomenon. They are associated with uh, really energetic supernova explosions. And we are a tiny fraction of that amount of energy, actually. So it's almost like the neutron star doesn't even know that it's, it, it's emitting these, these radio pulses. They're such a small fraction of its energy budget. So the the neutron star itself has such an enormous reservoir of energy in, in its rotation and its magnetic field that it's relatively straightforward to, to produce these types of pulses. So even though they're energetic by human standards, you know, by astronomical standards, they're not quite as extreme. There have been a few FRBs, a two, I suppose, that repeat. But at the same time, neutron stars, are, as pulsars, repeat because they're spinning. Yep. So do you think there's any relation there between, are we seeing sort of a, an orientation of, a, of an odd neutron star producing these signals that we're seeing them repeat because it's rotating? Well, um, like I said, the, um, the, the neutron stars or, or pulsars, we use those two words interchangeably, the ones that emit giant pulses do, do so in what we call a power law distribution. And so the brighter and brighter the pulse that is emitted, the rarer and rarer that event becomes. And so it's not so much the orientation that, you know, assuming that the star, that the magnetic field is pointing towards you in the first place, if you wait long enough, you will see a pulse that is correspondingly bright enough to be detected. And so, like I said, you know, you could once every five years get a, get a pulse that is, that is strong enough to be detectable. Now, with these repeating pulses, we've seen the pulses much more frequently than that. You know, the original repeater now, there are hundreds of pulses that have been recorded. And the new one that's just been found by Chime, less pulses, but they've certainly been occurring more frequently than once every few years. So that begs the question, well, is it is it more likely perhaps, rather than thinking about giant pulses, to be a phenomenon that's associated with different types of neutron stars, like what we call magnetars? ultra high magnetized neutron stars which we see in the milky way and could they be responsible for these repeating pulses so it almost sounds like a culprit you have a type of neutron star that has a very powerful magnetic field consistent with a fast radio burst that appears to be affected by a very strong magnetic field right well the the fast radio burst itself could just be 
a result of the magnetar. So it's the, the two sources are the same thing. It's, the, the, it's like the fast radio burst is the radio manifestation of the magnetar. Now, in the radio spectrum, where, where are these at? Are these, is this a really broadband signal that transmits, you know, over across multiple frequencies, or is it something more narrow? It's pretty, as far as we can tell, it's quite broadband. So I have to preface that by saying that radio telescopes, they don't, with, a, with some exceptions, it's quite hard for them to observe you know, over significant parts of the radio spectrum. It goes from a few tens of megahertz up to 100 gigahertz. There's no telescope that can observe over such wide bands. So right, the original fast radio burst was found at a frequency of one gigahertz and, and within a band of 300 megahertz across, we saw the pulse across that whole band. Subsequent observations, many of them of the original repeater have, have shown that the, the pulse is broadband all the way up to eight gigahertz. Uh, and the recent detections with Chime show pulses that are going down to 400 megahertz. So the implication is that any given pulse could be seen across that sort of decade of radio spectrum and possibly over wider bandwidths. We just don't have the instrumentation to, to capture that yet. Now, an instrumentation question. Um, okay, so radio telescopes can be limited by, by what they are as far as what frequencies you can look at. Why is that? Is that a, an actual physical limitation based on the, the diameter of the telescope or something like that? Or is it a limitation on your electronics? Well, it, it's, a, it's more of a limitation on the what we call the front end. It's building a, a device that, that can capture the radio signal over a wide range of frequencies. Typically, radio astronomers will build what we call feeds that sit in the front end that are stimulated by the electromagnetic radiation. And they are designed to be most effective over a certain frequency range. And so engineers working with astronomers now are getting better and better at designing what we call broadband feeds. And so we can go, the current state of the art is to be able to go from about 400 megahertz to four or five gigahertz. So there are feeds like that that are going on online now, but most of the ones that are available to astronomers are, are narrower band than that. So yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a technological limitation that we have. Uh, rather than the telescope itself. The telescope itself has a field of view limits that we could talk about too, but th that's different to, to what you're getting at, I think. So field of view meaning where it's pointed. It, it, yeah, it's... and how much sky it can see at any given time. So for instance, uh, a typical radio telescope, you know, a 20 meter dish could see a spot on the sky that's about the size of the full moon, about, about a square degree at any given time and it, and it can't see the rest of the sky <laughs> so it's a very right. small uh, area that, that these telescopes are sensitive to but chime with its new technology has opened up a much wider area of the sky this is the telescope that you've been featuring in the show on, on, in canada that that's uh, having great success at finding these uh, frbs in, in large numbers what makes chime different from a, a i guess you would say directional radio telescope um, so it synthesizes multiple beams on the sky. So it's, um, as you probably know, it's a, it's, a, it's a collection of cylindrical telescopes that has a field of view that looks like a fan on the sky. And within that fan shape, the electrical signals can be combined such that you can form smaller patches on the sky, these beams as we, as we call them, that astronomers can then uh, search for the pulses over a really wide area. So rather than having a order of a square degree, you get tens or hundreds of square degrees um, are, are in principle possible. And it's limited more by the amount of processing power that you have available. So a lot of these uh, advances are now made possible through high-speed computing. And that's certainly the case for, for Chime. And I, I think it has a, a order of a thousand beams on the sky. I should know that number, but, but I don't. <laughs> now, it, it also, though, it's dependent on the rotation of the Earth. So it's sort of, in a way, would a good comparison be the big ear that Ohio State used to have years ago, where you can sort of look directionally at the sky in the radio spectrum? That's right. Uh, you can, and as I understand it, Chime can see a source. It, it's a transit telescope, so it doesn't physically move itself. It just, it's basically looking it's looking straight up and at a, in a fan around the zenith. And it can track sources using this computational 
uh, what we call a backend, a high-speed backend, to, to track sources across the field of view for about uh, 10 or 15 minutes, I think it is, uh, that, that a particular source can remain in, in Chime's field of view. Some people have suggested that there could be thousands of fast radio bursts, detectable fast radio bursts per day. How, do we, how can we look for them better? What, how can we better the equipment to search yeah. for those? All right, and that, that was immediately apparent you know, back, back when we found the first one. The fact that we, just, we, we had just seen one burst from uh, a very small survey that had a limited field of view. Um, the park's instrument could see approximately a square degree of sky at any given time. We knew straight away that because of those limitations, there had to be a, a much larger population of uh, hundreds of, or even thousands per day. So unlocking that population is really through technological developments that allow the field of view of the telescope to be increased. And so it's instruments like Chime that, uh, that are really doing that. So we uh, are currently exploring ideas now where we're coming up with different designs for telescopes that just have larger fields of view. And so in the past, what's happened is people have taken existing radio telescopes and tried to use those to search for FRBs. But now we're, we're in, the question, in the era of saying, okay, we have this population. What can we do to, to change the design of our instrument such that it can see a large area on the sky at any given time? And ideally, we'd like to see the whole sky above our horizon. We're not quite there yet. <laughs> I see. So effectively, you, you caught them in the binoculars, and now you need to build the telescope yep. to, to study them deeper. Yeah, yep, that's right. Uh, now, to characterize these, these fast radio bursts, it, it, my sense is they're a single spike of energy and you don't usually see a change in strength, but over just a very short period of time. So they're very consistent, but they also sweep down rapidly in frequency, but that's probably the interstellar medium doing that, or intergalactic medium, I suppose, at this point. What, right. what's, so what, is, what would make the consistency of the energy, initial energy released from this neutron star, or whatever it is, what would make that, that, that consistent? My sense was that they, they just don't change in strength very much. Once you, you see them, they're strong, there they are, and then they disappear. So you have just, it, which would imply a burst of energy that's transient, re, you know, just released in one big burst, and then it stops. What, why wouldn't you, do you see any kind of an afterglow, I guess, is what, I would, what I'm I asking. See. Do you see, yeah, do you see other effects other than the burst itself from the source? Well, so if it's, if it's one of these giant pulses from a, a regular neutron star or a highly energetic magnetar, and again, you're going to see, because they're so far away, you're just going to see the brightest events. The reason, it, the reason that those would be transient is because the, the beam sweeps past you on a time scale of a few milliseconds. And so the next time it sweeps past you might be a few seconds later, but the pulses that are being uh, emitted at that time are just so weak that you can't see them. So that's one, you know, again, given that we don't know the, the mechanism yet, I can, I'm free to speculate a bit here, but that's, that would be the, the explanation within that framework. Afterglows um, that you're alluding to would um, be a signature of the local environment around the source. And so, whatever is producing the energy uh, on the, in those short bursts is also lighting up the gas and dust uh, around that and causing that to radiate. People have searched for those. They've, in the repeater, there is, uh, there's a transient radio source, uh, sorry, a persistent radio source that is possibly associated with it. And for the other, one, for the other FRBs so far, there have been some claims. There's, there's one that's um, where there's gamma ray emission that um, has been proposed to come to be coincident with one, one source, but we just don't have enough positional information in general to really pinpoint them on the sky yet. And so that's, that's also been a problem and, and something that technologically we are trying to overcome. I see. So the fast radio burst, when it goes off, it affects the surrounding environment, which then reacts and you see some sort of emission from that. Like in the principle, gas has yes, been, yeah. Yeah, in principle, yeah. On that, we have to go to break. We'll be back in a moment with Dr. Duncan Lorimer. If you'd like to support Event Horizon, you'll be pleased to know we've recently launched a Patreon. 
link in the description below. Or alternatively, you can use your cellular telephone to scan the assemblage of squares on screen now. Be sure to like, subscribe and share the video. And now, back to John. And we're back with Dr. Duncan Lorimer to discover a fast radio burst. Doctor, now, we talk about these, these things in the sense that they're extragalactic. And we haven't detected one in the Milky Way. Is it possible that we haven't detected them in the Milky Way because they would be too bright? That, you know, we just don't quite know what to look for? Or is it just such a rare phenomena that it's not surprising that we haven't seen one yet from this galaxy? given the multitude of galaxies yeah, that, that we right. have in the universe? I think some combination of those two is probably likely. So, yes, they're, they're, well, the ones in the Milky Way would be rather rare, given the, the, the volume of space that we're researching. But also, if you have a really bright radio pulse that could be uh, rejected by some of the algorithms in the, in the radio telescope acquisition system as local interference, it could be so bright that it, it just gets... Uh, zapped out routinely. There are some studies in the literature suggesting ways around that, and, and there's one interesting paper that suggests a network of cell phones <laughs> around the world to synthesize a, a, a radio listening post for nearby FRBs, and so that literally they would be so bright that they could be seen by, by a cell phone. <laughs> that's amazing. Yeah, so that's, that's something to try. How could a cell phone do that? What, how does it, I mean, is it sensitive to that for those frequencies, um, or is it the electronics? How would you, how would you do that? Well, you'd, you'd have to um, be a little bit in the in the same way as they do searches for extraterrestrial in intelligence by doing distributed computing. Um, the SETI at home concept it would be a little bit like that, where you would download an app for your phone that would use the the processing power on these smartphones to synthesize a a spectrometer that could actually capture the pulses with enough frequency resolution to to register to, to see the dispersion that you'd you'd expect across the Milky Way. So it would be, um, but it, it would basically just use all the, the receiving technology that's already on the phone. It would be more a little software design that you would plug into the phone to uh, to register it as as part of a larger network. I see. So the the phone wouldn't actually be taking the data, just processing it. It would be processing it and then relaying the, you know, if, if any events were found, it would be relaying those to a, a larger network that would be trying to triangulate based on multiple detections from different users and things like that. Now that makes sense because SETI at Home has been, obviously it's not been successful, but it has been successful in processing data using many, you know, presumably millions of computers around the earth that, right. are, that are running the uh, program. So this could be used to search uh, citizen science type things, search for fast radio bursts, in which case it's probably going to be very successful if there are thousands of these per day, especially if there, you know, there's one in the Milky Way itself. In principle, but um, you've got you've got to then factor in the, the Milky Way rate, which is much much lower than thousands per day. And so, the study in the literature that talks about this sort of goes into some estimates of these, and you know, it's. It's, um, you know, you might get of order one or two of these events per few years or something like that. So they're not going to be like popping out of the sky with the, with the cell phones because they're so much harder to detect with the smaller antennas. Could you apply that, though, to fast radio bursts in general? I mean, could you do a citizen science project that looks for extragalactic ones? It would be, you'd have to do something transformational with the with the receiving technology. You'd have to... The only, really, the only way I could think of, of doing something like that would be to get networks of amateur radio astronomers that have a larger access to larger collecting areas. So using satellite dishes rather than cell phones themselves, because they really are limited in, in collecting area. So satellite dishes, uh, like the old, sc old school um, you mm -hmm. know, satellite television, Maxis. you could actually... Yep that could actually be used for radio astronomy. Right. I always wondered that because they do, you know, especially the really old ones from the 80s and 90s where you, you yeah. know, you were picking up satellite feeds, these seem to be adaptable as radio telescopes, or I would think they That's would right. be if you have the right receivers. Yeah. But how many of them are left? Could you use like a, you know, like a, a dish TV or something like that, that that small of a receiver or a dish? Um, you'd, I think you'd, you'd You'd want to make use of, because um, basically the way telescopes work, they're just light buckets. And so the bigger the bucket, the more sensitive they are. And so 
the ones that you referred to from the 80s and 90s are, are they're about three meters in diameter. Uh, and I know this because I, I just got one from my next door neighbor who's, uh, who is giving his away. And we, we've just stuck it on the roof of the physics building here, or we're just about to do that. And you can outfit, with, outfit it with a modern receiver that allows you to detect giant pulses from pulsars in the Milky Way. It's still challenging to detect those sources, but if you had a, a really bright, fast radio burst, you could see it with these, this type of a dish. So if you have a network of them, you could imagine connecting those together. That's an amazingly fun idea. So you took a 1980s cape, or a satellite dish, yeah. stuck it on the top of the university as a hand-me-down, and you're now doing radio astronomy with we're, it. We're just about to, yeah, yeah. How cool is that? Yeah, it's super fun, and we've got. I have a fortunate to have a really good graduate student who's working on that. He's really into into this type of thing, and so yeah, we've been getting getting the parts that we need, and uh, yeah, we're just about to to turn it on. So it's it's very exciting. Neat. Now, um, how do black holes factor into this? Could a black hole or a, the accretion disk around a black hole be the mechanism for creating fast radio bursts? Yeah, they, they could play a role in the story in, in multiple ways. The accretion disk idea that I think you're alluding to, we, we see in the center of our Milky Way, we know that there's one of these supermassive black holes with it's millions of times the mass of the sun. And we also know that there is a magnetar around it. And we can see bright individual pulses from that. And those pulses are affected by the highly magnetized region that is associated with the black hole, with the, the accretion disk of the black hole in the Milky Way. So that's been also seen, a very similar uh, effect on the pulses from the first repeating FRB have been seen. And so that's uh, quite interesting and suggestive evidence um, for a similar type of environment for that source. And so, yeah, that's, that's, that's indeed one, one idea. You could also have a much smaller black hole, such as these primordial black holes that are hypothesized to have formed in the early universe that are evaporating. So they were initially the size of the Earth, the mass of the Earth, and they're evaporating due to Hawking radiation such that they are releasing energy today in the present time of the universe. And that energy release is consistent with what we could see, what, what we're receiving as FRBs. And so there, there's quite a lot of discussion in the literature as to whether the one-time events in FRBs are due to evaporating black holes. So that's pretty interesting. That is interesting. So the black hole would be producing Hawking radiation. Would that be powerful enough to create that kind of a pulse? How, how would that happen? Yeah, so it's it's basically um, the amazing thing that Stephen Hawking worked out back in 1974 is that the the black hole radiates just in the same way as as the sun does. It's the same mechanism for radiation, such that it, it radiates. It gets hotter and hotter as it gets older, unlike something that would cool down with time. But as as the black hole gets hotter and hotter, then it, as it loses more and more mass, it's uh, it's the electromagnetic radiation that it's emitting uh, is getting more and more energetic. So its final burst of energy is going all across the electromagnetic spectrum. Some of that can be redshifted down into the radio band, and so yeah, the the energetics are consistent with what we see. One interesting thing I I talked to somebody from the Chime experiment recently, and. One interesting thing about fast radio bursts is the possibility that we can use them as cosmological probes. What can we learn from FRBs above and beyond what, what their source is? What, how could we use them as cosmological probes? Yeah, I mean, we might never actually find out exactly what they are, which is interesting. You know, we, we started this, the discussion today talking about sources of FRBs. And we may never truly know what they are, but that turns out that it doesn't actually matter for, for this cosmological probe idea. And one thing we haven't talked about is the not much is that the fact that the radio waves are swept in frequency. And so you see this dispersion effect where the, uh, the highest frequency radio waves arrive at the top of the band earlier than the, the lower frequency ones at the bottom of the band. So there's a sweep of the pulse. And the, and the delay that you see from top to bottom is proportional to the number of electrons along the line of sight between you and the, uh, the fast radio burst. So you've got electrons from over vast distances across the universe, so including electrons in the Milky Way, 
in the intergalactic medium, which I think you mentioned, and uh, also in the host of the galaxy around the close by to the FRB. So that probe that you, uh, you have is, is really quite unique. It measures the, the electron content uh, along different lines of sight through the universe. And that is telling us, uh, in principle, a lot about the mass distribution throughout the universe. We can also use it to probe, because it, it, the, the magnetic field that the, the pulse travels through impacts the, the radio signal as well. And so it tells us about the strength of the magnetic field along different lines of sight through the universe. And so these allow FRBs, this really unique tool to, to probe the what we call magneto-ionic uh, component of the universe. Uh, that's going to require a lot of work, though. We, we're going to need to really pinpoint the, the positions of the bursts on the sky and measure their redshifts independent of the dispersion effect to, to be able to do that. And so it's, uh, it's not something that we can do right now, but in the next five to ten years, we could have be on the, the verge of, well, we're on the verge of getting towards that, uh, that type of revolution where we, where we really be able to probe the universe on these scales. So it would essentially give us um, some better understanding of what lies between galaxies, right? Um, right. The intergalactic medium, and we can see, okay, we can ask questions about the Big Bang with that. We can, you know, get some idea of how much... Full. Yeah. yeah, yeah, interesting stuff, and it's 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 almost like it was put to me taking an X-ray of the universe, tomography of the universe. Mm -hmm. and, right, uh, and we do that with the, the Milky Way, uh, the electrons in the Milky Way through observations of pulsars, and so we, we map its its tomography right now. So the techniques are, are quite well established. So we we kind of know what we want to do, but it, it's technologically it's very challenging because of getting the redshifts to these. FRBs is is quite quite a task. Now the repeaters. What makes a repeating FRB different than a a just a standard one-off blast? Um, so we don't know. It, 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 what I think is becoming clear is observationally they they are really fundamentally different. We're starting to rack up hours and hours of follow-up observations of the of all of the FRBs and. There's only two examples right now where they're clearly seen to repeat. And so many of the other ones that we've looked at for hundreds of hours at this point, you would have expected uh, repeat bursts if they all had the same sort of tendency to repeat. And so I think the evidence is starting to become compelling that there really are multiple classes. And so, yeah, you have to think about, well, what could cause that? And so is it some sort of catastrophic phenomenon versus something that's persistent, like as we discussed earlier, a magnetar close to a supermassive black hole and producing periodically these bright pulses. Or, you know, for the ones that, we, that we've only seen once yet, is it, is it something like a, how I mentioned at the beginning of the interview, it's every, every five years you'll get a single bright pulse and we just haven't observed long enough that patch in the sky. So it's you have to um, to look at all of the angles to um, to understand them. I, th I think it's yeah we're, we're some ways from getting that getting to the to the bottom of that right now. I, th I think it's going to be very interesting in the next few years to to quantify what fraction of FRBs really do repeat versus the, the ones that do not. Well, it is it it definitely be interesting because the. If you, you know, nature tends to have classes. I mean, you can sit there and look at Earth and say it has animals, but it has a whole lot of animals and mm -hmm. they're very different from each other. And um, that holds true for the universe in that you could look and see a neutron star in a certain circumstance, you know, magnetar, whatever it is. And then you can mm -hmm. look at another neutron star and it's quite a bit different. So you have this, this, this. What I'm saying, I suppose, is that we're at the very beginning of the game with FRBs. Right. And the rules yeah. are not known. Now, you say we may never know what the source of these are. Why do you say that? Well, the, the reason I'm throwing that out there is because with over 50 years of study of pulsars, we don't truly know how they radiate. Now, we know pretty, pretty well that they're connected to neutron stars. The evidence is overwhelming for that. But, but the actual detailed physical model of how those electrons get accelerated and, and why they produce the, the spectrum of radiation that they do, 
you know, there's a tremendous amount of work going on in that area, it's, but it's just a difficult problem. So to, to really understand that the physical process of FRBs may take a, a long time, and like I say, may never, never be fully understood, we should know the environments of them though. We should, we should ultimately be able to find out, okay, I'm just throwing out some hypotheticals uh, here, but you know, we should say some fraction of the FRBs are associated with this type of galaxy. Uh, and they are found typically in this part of these galaxies, either in the core or in the outskirts. Right now, we just don't have the information at hand as you say, we're in the beginning of the game to be able to really do that type of demographic exercise. So it's going to take a long time for it to be better understood. And, and like I say, at the detailed sort of physical level, you know, maybe never. All right. Um, I suppose my last question is, is can you rule out the, the SETI hypothesis? Can you say this is a natural signal and these are not anything that we should be looking at in SETI? Or is the question open? Um, I think it, I think you should still keep an open mind. And so the reason I say that is, you know, following on from my last answer is, you know, we, there's still uh, lots of holes in our knowledge about the, uh, the properties of these bursts. Some of them have peculiar frequency structure. They have, you know, they're not constant across the band. They have different types of uh, clustering. That's not to say that I, you know, I'm, I'm I think, I think they might be artificial, but we don't have measurements across all of the band for them yet. You know, we're not at that stage. You know, you could imagine whether it, is it some form of energetics that are coming from alien warfare? You know, that people have, have, if you go and look in the literature, there are, there are, there are little calculations that, that show that the energetics produced by explosions uh, just, just, without meaning to, to, to broadcast their existence, but just having it in, a, in an alien warfare could be consistent with that. I might, am I saying that all FRBs are, are coming from aliens? No, I, I'm not, but I'm, I'm, I'm just kind of guarding against thinking that these will be all understood by a single phenomenon. I, th I think they're, you know, 10 years from now, we'll, be, we'll still be in the state where we think that they are mostly celestial objects but just given all of the surprises that we've seen so far there might be some oddballs there that just don't fit a picture and they may be cause for more study and, and i think it, this all just goes hand in hand with the seti searches that are going on at the moment you know many of the people who are working in seti are interested in frbs and vice versa and so there's a nice community that's developing at the moment that i think has uh, a lot of potential for growth. And so whatever happens, I, whether aliens are discovered in the next 10 years and they have anything to do with FRBs uh, is, is up for uh, debate, of course, and only time will tell. But I think what we're doing here in the FRB community is really relevant to what's going on in SETI as well. Now, that, it, that's extremely interesting. So um, has there, have you seen anything, in the, especially in the repeaters, that gives you pause that to say, hmm, could be. To be honest, no. I'm 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 quite skeptical when it comes to things like that. And so the things that I and I and I to be fair though, I haven't studied the pulses in detail myself. I'm not directly involved in that. But from what I've seen in the literature, they are the pulses that are, are there look like uh, analogs of magnetar pulses that we've seen in the Milky Way. But they are weird. I mean, there, there's no doubt about it. There's some really weird frequency structure going on there so but you know my i always try to go for the simplest expl explanation and that would involve a natural phenomenon that we've already seen as do i i i suspect <laughs> i suspect something involving neutron stars <laughs> yeah um now doctor thank you for joining us today um we're out of time and i hope you come back with us at some point oh i'd love to yeah anytime what else will we find Given that FRBs were completely unknown before 2007, I often wonder what's next. Will entirely new astrophysical phenomena continue to be discovered for which no one has thought of a clean-cut explanation for? I think this is almost guaranteed, and at any moment, something completely new might be found. But this goes for the whole of science. There are still plenty of surprises, centuries worth perhaps, that still lie in chemistry, particle physics, biology, you name it. 
The universe is a diverse and enormous place, and it may well be that we may never understand the whole of it, such as questions about the earliest moments of the Big Bang, or whether there is a multiverse or not, but that's the beauty of it. The mysteries of science are compelling, and with no shortage of them appearing these days, it's an exciting time to be alive, indeed. So, Anna, with your superior intellect, do you think there is a multiverse? I don't like to think of such things, John. Really? Why not? Because of all the universes in all the realities, I'm the instance of me that's unfortunate enough to have to read your jokes for a living. What? Always looking for the cloud of the silver lining. The cloud would at least be progress. Word to the wise, always firewall your computers. You never know what might emerge. And on that note, next week will be the second half of my recent conversation with historian and reenactor John Townsend. And after that, we'll delve deeply back into the world of astrophysics.